work of Heights is an immersive virtual reality work. It's multi-sensory, it's um, a representation of a natural environment, but not quite a reality. Uh, it's trying to imagine a plant-based perspective of what a plant might see or feel around it. My first plant-based works were um, artificial, working with fake plants from Ikea that I took apart and put motors on and reanimated in a sense. It was tapping into the idea of plant blindness, the idea that people don't see different plants around them as unique, but just as interchangeable green things. Creating those earlier works, I was really conscious of trying to use humour to encourage audiences to let their guard down and then address real issues after that. A, a lot of my work is working with technology. Um, I think my earlier practice was thinking about the everyday in a sense and um, challenging the way that we see familiar objects around us and over the last number of years that's much more um, the everyday is technology the everyday is the screen so I've moved towards that VR was a natural extension of that practice I think it's an interesting technology because so many people that I put in the headset, it's still their first time going in it. So it's not as widespread as it, as it might be in the future, um, but it still really represents a concerted push towards this sort of multi-layered reality that we might be headed towards. Within the artwork, there's a strong sense of the simulation of the natural and whether an artificial reality will end up substituting for that in the future. My name is Monica Gagliano. I'm a research associate professor of evolutionary ecology at the moment, directing the Biological Intelligence Lab at Southern Cross University up in Lismore. I first encountered Monica Gagliano's work through an article by Michael Pollan in The New Yorker called The Intelligent Plant. The article broadly was looking at plant feelings and all of these different things and there was a bit of a, um, a sort of 60s idea to some of that research, but her work was really looking at the hard science of it. and. I was really inspired by seeing new technologies or new ways of exploring this medium that were solid science. I found out she lived in Australia and reached out to her. One of the research areas that I've developed is uh, called plant bioacoustics and it's a relatively new field and it's about sound and plants. The very short story of it is how plants use sound in their everyday plant business life. And uh, so these are sound uh, mediating transactions in their dealings with other animals, other circumstances around them, as well as how plants use uh, em emit their own sound. Possibly, we are uh, at this point not sure, but hypothesizing that these sounds are used to also mediate those transactions that the plants themselves are producing. And this transaction can be from, you know, dealing with potential pollinators and or dealing with potential predators, as well as looking for uh, resources like water and nutrients in the environment. So basically it's like sound, plants and uh, the two together. Stopping and listening is always an important part of engaging with natural environments. Vision isn't your most important sense in a forest or in um, a place where sound is going to be, how you discover where an animal is, if you're into birds, how you know where the birds are. I understand that for most of us as humans, 
uh, it, it, it seems a little difficult to perceive the uh, or conceive the idea that plants could uh, use and listen to and produce sounds because they don't have vocal cords, they don't have ears. Uh, but we also already know that um, even in, within the animal kingdoms, we have several examples and species that don't have ears like we do, for example, but they can totally use sound. A good example are snakes who use the jaw bones to detect the vibration. And, and uh, in other cases like fish, the, the ears are there, but they are internal. So we don't see them, but they are pretty much structured very similarly to ours com in comparison. So basically the, the, the real question here is that sound ultimately from a physics perspective is a mechanical vibration, a mechanical wave. So if you have a body, <laughs> you qualify. And from this perspective, plants have bodies and therefore they qualify. And even if we, at this stage, we don't really necessarily understand how they do it, but from a behavioral perspective, we know that they definitely use sound and they use it, as I said, to, um, to manage and to liaise with the, the environment and other animals. And good, beautiful example emerging from the research in the, I would say the last 10 years, has been, you know, uh, work from uh, colleagues in Israel, looking at how plants increase the amount of sugar in their flowers when they perceive the arrival of a bee. Even this response happens even to just the sound, the recording of the arrival of a bee. So the, there is no bee and the plant is like preparing itself to be more attractive. My own work was focusing on water and similarly like the plants will respond to the sound of water and will direct the growth of the roots towards that sound, even if there is no water to be found. Soon after starting with VR, I realized how powerful it was as a sound tool. The Soundscapes you can create in virtual reality, uh, you can do things that you couldn't do in reality. You can really constrict the bleed of sound. You can uh, filter the way that different sounds interact with each other, or um, when you enter a specific space, one sound will change, become more clear, become muddy as you walk away. And it was a really exciting tool to work with, thinking about how we can create a soundscape that is somewhat like a natural environment, but also um, something that couldn't exist in reality. A simulation and artificial uh, elements of nature are part of the work. So there's some foley that's fake nature, uh, but then there's just recordings and some of them were almost incidental. I went uh, camping and bushwalking over the last few years and recorded morning bird song or things that I was attracted to and those recordings found their way into the overall soundscape of the work. The plant perspective was, it guided the colour palette, thinking about, you know, plants generally being green, uh, given that that's the colour they reflect, but they're absorbing the magenta, the reds, the blues, and uh, I understood a plant perspective to be reflecting those colours. Um, it's also something that's quite diffuse. The edges of everything is quite blurred. It's trying to re represent the visual in a non-visual capacity. At times, I think of it as, yeah, like an experimental documentary, but it also really depends on the audience and the way they want to engage. The work occupies about um, 50 square metres. It's on an eight metre diameter circle. So um, it's something where people can free roam. We specifically worked with the Quest VR headset because it's untethered, there's no computer, there's no laptop that you carry around with you, there's no cables. So it feels much easier to enter that virtual reality with something that's not very heavy or not really um, distracting you. And when you enter the space, you can walk around this. Um, there's no one way to do it. Some people kind of stand still, some people just roam around the whole space. Um, you can lie down, you can crawl around, 
And having, you know, created the work, I've gone through it dozens of times and now and then I'll just lie down and experience it in a very still, static way. And there's something that you get from that experience you don't get from walking around. The landscape was crafted, it was actually crafted in virtual reality. There's um, some pretty great apps that you can just go in and you're in VR creating something for VR. They were representations of, in a general sense, my childhood backyard where I grew up. Um, and I think that was important because the introduction also has a audio description, a, a description that you would give for blind or low vision audiences describing the natural environment. So. As you go in, there's the environment slowly building around you while the narrator is, is describing what it is. Welcome. Let's take a moment to slow down. Taking a long breath in. And a long breath out. Meditation is part of my practice, I guess, as a person, but as an artist too, maybe. Um, and I didn't want to be too heavy with that as the introduction, but it was more thinking about slowing down and breathing together as a way to help facilitate a really good experience of the virtual reality. Working with Josh Hull, he's a computer scientist and you know, philosopher and everything. He's um, a really interesting person in the way that he approaches technology, maybe in, in a similar way to Monica, trying to think about how he can approach technology from outside or from ways which haven't been done before. Uh, he did all of the hard stuff in the project. He did the VR and the the coding and the electronics. He was quite a guiding force in a lot of the ideas and where we went. Um, and as I said, he has a very strong background in philosophy and was able to help guide a lot of that side of it too. So why Epiphytes? I think I grew up around a lot of Epiphytes. Um, and as you would know, Epiphytes are a plant which, or an organism that grows on another plant. Mm -hmm. And I saw that existence of absorbing moisture from the air, um, absorbing nutrients from just litter, leaf refuse, and being connected, but being in harmony, being in a symbiotic relationship with something. I saw that as just um, a way of being, maybe a mm -hmm. suggestion of how audiences can reflect on how they interact with each other, with. Mm -hmm other species, with ecosystems in general. I guess when I saw the title, um, what inspired me was uh, that, as you just said, the epiphytes, the two bodies, needs to find a balance between the, the, the needs of each other. And, um, and so there must be a really high degree of sensitivity towards the, your own need as one of the members of this collective and, and the needs of the other. And uh, because plants are sessile and the epiphytes choose to, you know, sit on someone else that is not going to move around, um, again, it speaks of this uh, sense, the almost hypersensitivity to the circumstances as they change and the needs and as they fluctuate. So it, it almost inspires like a little dance between uh, you as the self, a plant or whatever, and the other that lives with you. Yeah. And so it's a beautiful model, as you said, for inspiring us maybe to be a little bit more sensitive. <laughs> yeah. I guess in, in a more broader philosophical sense, and I know as a scientific term, well, meaning, but I also think a lot about the idea of the holobiont, the, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a human sense, it would be you and all your, your organisms in your stomach or the creatures on your skin existing as an ecological unit. And thinking about it broadly, I think about how we are all part of these ecological mm -hmm. units, all part of a holobiont that if you think in this way, then you're going to be more 
sensitive to that. It's like, a, you know, we are the epiphytes, all of us on this planet, <laughs> you know, living on this planet and, and we are going a little bit astray, I think. But the idea is like, we are here to all live in an harmonious way in relationship with this planet and everyone else on it. So yeah, it's a beautiful, I thought it was a beautiful choice. I like working with artists because they are allowed <laughs> to ask questions that I am not officially allowed to ponder. And so it gives me this liberty vicariously through the artist uh, to be able to, yeah, explore possibilities. As an artist, I'm, I'm interested in the unknown and I'm interested in encouraging audiences to think about things or see things in a way that they haven't before. And science is the same. I think um, that curiosity is part of what drives Monica. It's what drives a lot of artists. And I think, yeah, in a sense, the spaces between those fields or the unexplored space is yeah, where I exist. What science is for me is primarily exploration of the unknown. <laughs> so, um, and I believe that if we use always the same method to ask the same question, or even different question, but always with the same method, we are just reducing it always to a specific valve through which that knowledge is supposed to go through, even if that knowledge might not fit in that valve or through that uh, channel. And, um, and I'm, I became very aware through my own personal experiences that there are other bodies of knowledge, uh, including obviously indigenous uh, bodies of knowledge, uh, which are not only enormous, but potentially even better ways of looking at the question that I'm asking. I think any, any additional awareness for the life of plants or the perspective of plants, it, I think it's beneficial in terms of thinking about greater things like climate, uh, thinking about the interconnections in ecosystems, but also just how we treat other species, how we treat other humans. Plants, to me, are you know more about harmony or symbiotic relationships.